All right, I think that uh, most of the people that are coming are here. And so I'd like to uh, say good afternoon, everyone. I am Tanya Phillips, and I'm the Senior Associate Director for New Ventures and Alliances in the Office of Technology Commercialization. And I wanna welcome you to our OTC monthly webinar. And I am very excited about the topic today and the panel that we have assembled to discuss it. So the title of this webinar is Think Like an Entrepreneur. And so we'll be discussing the process for making that mental shift from thinking like a researcher to thinking more like an entrepreneur. And so our intention is to show how our panelists have successful, successfully made that shift and to gain some insights from their entrepreneurial journey. journey. And uh, these three panelists have embraced the opportunities offered by OTC to learn to commercialize their technologies and um, also to parlay that into startup companies. So pretty exciting what they've all done. So without further ado, I'm going to let each one of them introduce themselves um, and talk about their startup journey and include in that, what made you wanna start on this journey in the first place? So Jared, I would like to start with you first. Sure. Um, so my name is Jared Hamill. I'm a, a research assistant professor working with Dr. Kip Guy in the College of Pharmacy. We also have a great group of students, postdocs and staff scientists. And, and our lab really seeks to develop novel treatments for substance use disorder, oncology, and infectious disease. And so the most advanced of our projects is our anti-malarial drug, SJ733, which is, is currently dosing our first patients in a phase 2A clinical trial in Peru. And I think really why I got interested in entrepreneurial learnings is because we really wanted to translate our findings to patients. And we wanted to be able to take this dream of addressing a significant unmet clinical need and actually deliver it to the people that need it and do that in a sustainable way. All right, thank you, Jared. Uh, Janelle, would you like to tell us about yourself and your, your company? Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, um, I was the, uh, uh, I was a, a clinical academic medical physicist for about 30 years uh, and um, enjoyed that. And it was a, a good career and everything. But I found myself um, getting, um, well, a, kind of needing a change, a life change anyway. Um, but um, being a little bit frustrated with um, kind of, uh, I don't know, the, the currency, I guess, academic currency, uh, you know, in order to kind of advance in academia, you publish papers and get grants and, and things like that. Um, but it, you, you always have to wonder how much it actually translates uh, to, to anything, anything useful. Does anybody actually ever read your articles? Um, and one of the most um, uh, interesting um, articles I ever read was about how to write a good research paper um, or present research. And they, they said, um, who, to think about whose behavior are you going to change? If you haven't changed anybody's behavior, then you really haven't done anything. And that was in the context of uh, publishing research. Um, and so I used to tell my students that, whose behavior are you going to change? And I felt like, um, I feel like it's very similar um, in the entrepreneurial world. And um, one of the reasons that I wanted to go the business route and the entrepreneurial route is so that it could focus more directly on customers, what's the need and um, just changing somebody's behavior, use this device because it'll help solve an important problem for you, so. All right, thank you, Janelle. Uh, Megan, you wanna tell us about your background? Sure, I am Dr. Megan Marsak. I am a clinical psychologist in the Department of Pediatrics here at UK. Um, I am currently an associate professor as well. And I recently became the CEO of the Selly Coping Company. Um, my main interest is around trying to create tools and figure out ways to creatively support kids through medical treatment and support their families as well. And so as part of that, a number of years ago, we created the Selly Coping Kit. Oh, let's see if I can get Selly into, into focus here. This is part of the Coping Kit here. 
Um, and so really we took, and I'm a researcher by heart, and so took and infused all this evidence and the science into this coping kit to try to um, reach more kids and families. And when I first came to the to OTC, it was really around how can we take this um, tool and this creation that we have, that we've had some good science behind, um, that's in the nonprofit sector right now, to figure out a way to better reach more kids and families. And that's kind of where I started on this path. Okay. And any of you guys can jump in on this. So talk about some of the key decisions that you have had to make already in, in your entrepreneurial path and to, to get it to further advance in, in, your, in this pathway. What, what key decisions made you, um, pushed you further down the line? I'll, I'll go. Um, and it was um, quitting my job. <laughs> uh, that was a big one. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I started uh, kind of on this entrepreneurial journey. Um, I'm not sure I ever said what we make, so sorry about that. Um, we're making a new, uh, new um, product or a suite of products um, for, uh, for quality assurance devices for radiation therapy. Um, and um, I, I started on this journey while I was still director of medical physics there at UK and got to the point where um, I just uh, didn't have that much time or energy to devote to it. Um, and I thought, um, well, uh, you know, if I quit my job and devote all my time to this, um, am I going to be able to do this? What if I fail? All of those things. And then I thought, well, I'm certain of one thing, and that is if I don't devote full time to it, I know it will fail. Um, so that was kind of the big decision point for me. And um, it's been a, been a great decision. That's great. So it, one of the things that, you know, investors look at is what, how devoted someone is to their startup company. Um, so quitting your job is um, saying that you're pretty much devoted. I don't think that's completely necessary for um, all of our researchers. I think you're in a, a position to do that, uh, but um, that's certainly showing dedication. Um, so Megan or Jared, what do you guys, what key decisions have you had to make? Um, well, I made a key decision not to quit my job um, and to try to fit, fit this in and, and think about creatively how can I kind of partner with UK in some way. So some of the research that we're doing is still through UK, um, but then also figure out in my non-UK time, like how to, how to make it work and, and, and juggle all of those pieces. Um, I think along the lines too was just the decision about whether to try, it, try for it for real versus try for it kind of around the edges. And I do remember that the moment, I think it was Ian that asked me, do you want to be an entrepreneur? And I said very clearly and definitively, no, I have no interest in that. Um, but I think a key decision for me was as a researcher and an academic, I'm always interested in learning more. So when UK Excel's program was offered as a, well, do you want to learn more? I'm like, yes, I can do that. And then it was more for me, like kind of really small baby steps along the way, um, which felt lo a lot less overwhelming to me um, and just kind of being willing to kind of keep going on that. Thank you. Jared? Yeah, I, I think I followed a very similar track to Megan. I'm still uh, an assistant professor here in the College of Pharmacy, and, and I'm lucky enough that the research that we do is partially funded through grant mechanisms that we continue to, to receive through the University of Kentucky. Um, but I think, you know, kind of the decision for me was I, I realized that the technology was just going to kind of sit there. And, and, you know, I could either be okay with that, um, or I could kind of get out there and try to, you know, change behavior. I, I think that's a really important uh, concept and, and actually try to increase the translation of this technology into the clinician's hands and, and hopefully ultimately convince them that this was a therapy that was worth administering to their patients because it provided some benefit for us, hopefully safety and efficacy. Um, and, and so I think the UXL uh, the UXL accelerator program was perfect for me because I said, man, I really want to translate this technology, but I have absolutely no idea how to do it. And I picked up a couple of books and, and they spoke a whole different language. And so I think, you know, through the OTC communications and through the UXL program, it really afforded me the opportunity to start to learn that language and to start to identify the key knowledge gaps so that I could start filling them in. Um, it also revealed to me the wealth of resources in OTC 
and just how genuinely interested they are in, in helping you along your journey wherever you are. Um, so, so yeah. Well, Jared, being the overachiever, you just answered my next question. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I want to come back around to something that, that I uh, got from all of you is that you had a uh, very intense desire to see your technology out in the marketplace. So that's what really drove you um, to pursue this path. Um, so let's talk about some of the OTC programs um, that you guys have participated in. Can you talk about what you've done and some of the takeaways and lessons, uh, how it changed your thinking about um, pursuing a path of entrepreneurship? I'll sure, so since I maybe already started, I'll say, yeah, I, I completed the Launch Blue Accelerator um, and I'm currently involved in the incubator. And that is just really a great excuse to get to talk to Eric, who I see is on the line with, with some frequency. Um, what did I learn? I, I definitely started to identify those key knowledge gaps and really uh, that it's its own language. So I, I kind of alluded to that, but I think one of my favorite was in a very, maybe even the very first um, session, we talked about an MVP. And I come from a sports background, so I'm thinking, oh, most valuable player, this is going to be the person on my team that really drives the product. And, and they looked at me and said, no, 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 no. We're talking about a minimum viable product. What's the first thing that you can get out there, get to your user base and, and, and let them start playing with, critiquing and, and give you the opportunity to continuously improve that product? Um, and so I think just beginning to learn that, that new terminology has been really helpful. Also, one of the, the big things kind of switching from, from an academic hat to an entrepreneurial hat, I had always identified kind of my customers for this therapeutic to be the patients that would receive it. Um, and I think through the process of the accelerator, I really identified that, um, you know, the patients are of course important and we need to give them a benefit or we're gonna get no compliance, but it's actually, you know, the payers of the drug who are often not the patients. They could be government or insurance or, or whatever they are. And how do you convince them that you're giving them a good return on their investment? Um, and, and then how do you give investors a return on their investment? Malaria is a challenge there because the average anti-malarial therapy is a dollar for a therapy, right? So we're not, it's not like our cancer research where we're coming in at $172,000 a course. Uh, we're at a dollar four. And so how do you create that sustainable business model that gives investors the confidence to, to invest in you and help translate your technology? Uh, and that's just taken me down paths I totally didn't expect. Um, groups that I thought I should be pursuing, I found were totally wrong. People I needed to start establishing relationships with, I did. I got out there, did some informational interviews, got to meet with clinicians from all over the world that I just cold called because you know, that was my homework for that week. Um, and boy, did that, that reform my theories around, you know, what am I targeting? So for drug discovery, we call it our target product profile. Um, and so I think, boy, that, that is probably the bi single biggest takeaway that has kind of launched me forward after the completion of the, the UXL. So Jared, I think we need to have you teach the customer discovery portion of, of UXL. I think you can do that well. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the one of those sections that we have uh, we struggle with people getting out of their comfort zone. I, th I think you could do a good job there. So uh, Janelle, can you talk about some of the OTC programs that you've participated in and, and what you've learned from them? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I think I'm kind of like an OTC junkie. Uh, I, I feel like I need a frequent flyer program with you guys. Um, so I did the Excel program uh what two two and a half years ago i think and and that was great um and then i did the uh the boot camp the von Elman center boot camp i think um for a semester uh and then i had a wonderful opportunity um to have our company be one of the um uh test companies in uh, uh david goodnight and uh, eric hawks um uh entrepreneur uh, uh course that was taught over there in the um uh in the uh the gatton school um and um, 
Uh, anyway, so let's see, I did that. And then I just finished up uh, another round of, uh, of Launch Blue, and I'm uh, hoping to be accepted in the incubator <laughs> program. Um, so I've done all that. Um, you know, what have I learned? What are the takeaways? Um, I, you know, I, what, one thing I do know is that I just think differently now than when I first started. And some of the things are that were very counterintuitive at the beginning are, are becoming a lot more intuitive um, to me right now. Um, but uh, again, kind of going back to um, uh, how I, I used to try to get my students to talk about research, um, whenever I'd get them to uh, ask them about their research project, uh, they would tend to say, oh, well, uh, we're writing a MATLAB program to do such and such. And, you know, as, as, as you know, technology people, we get so, wrapped up and excited in our technology. I got this technology to, and so, but it's like, what important problem are you trying to solve? Um, and, uh, you know, the entrepreneur community, it's, you know, what, what's the pain point? What value are you adding? Don't even talk about technology. It has nothing to do with it at that point. So um, yeah, anyway, so, so uh, yeah, so there was that. Um, and, you know, it, it, Megan very, um, nicely said it's you know it's just it's just baby steps you know if you if i thought about the totality of everything i was getting myself in for i would be curled up in a fetal position in a corner somewhere still um so you just you just take uh, uh take baby steps um but uh, but there's also this difference uh and i might be jumping ahead to one of the other uh questions but um um you know i thought i was becoming a business person Whereas being a business person and being an entrepreneur are not exactly the same thing. There's a lot of overlap. And I think sometimes people use the term entrepreneur when they mean business person, uh, but it's not exactly the same thing. And so it's important to kind of get that distinction uh, clear in your mind uh, or earlier on. How, how did you make that distinction for yourself? I'm not sure I have to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's like we say, it's it's a journey, but um, but you know, I kind of they're not really mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. I, you can't be an entrepreneur without having built a business. So uh, let's just take it one step at a time, and let's uh, build a business, get a team, sell some products, uh, and then uh, then I think you can um, you know kind of kind of go from there. But it's. Uh, you know, it's, it's like you take baby steps and maybe something isn't what you thought you were going to do in the first place. And then you evolve and say, yeah, that's that's, uh, you know, uh, probably the best way to go. So mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a learning process. <laughs> yeah. All right, Megan, you want to talk about uh, OTC programs that you participated in? Sure. I started in the, the Excel program um, for faculty, and, and I think that really was key in me being able to see that, see kind of the potential of the them being able to bring the product to market. I already knew very clearly the potential value that the product had. Um, as far as we know that kids um, have emotional health problems and they're under supported, it's really well documented. So I think, you know, that part was already really clear to me. It was more of, oh, this is actually potentially really marketable and, and there might be a different way to get it, get it to folks. Um, and I also did bootcamp one, 1.0 and 2.0. Um, and then have been ongoing doing some coaching um, through OTC through with Eric Cartman as well. And I don't recall what the name of that program is. So Tanya, feel free to. <laughs> I, I, I think you're in the ongoing support program, Megan. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I need ongoing support. So I will say, I think one of the things that has been really key for me, thank you, UK Excel Incubator. Thank you, Laura. Um, so I think one of the things that's been really key for me is um, having the ongoing support because I think there, there are many places along the way that can start to feel overwhelming or just you don't know like the next step or where to turn that you could get really discouraged or I would have potentially gotten really discouraged but knowing that even though one of your primary programs might be over you can reach out for help and, and you know send an SOS to try to get you keeping moving and on track I think has been really key. I think the other thing I really learned kind of throughout was as a researcher, a lot of the skills that you already have are completely applicable. So, you know, often we have big visions and we see big problems and we want to solve problems. And all it is is taking your vision and breaking it down into steps. We're often really good at overcoming barriers and working with crazy systems. And so I think a lot of 
what you have to do as a researcher really is well suited for entrepreneurship as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, it's a different language that you have to learn to communicate what you're doing is, is what makes the two different, but there, there are a lot of similarities. Um, so uh, what, would you, what would you guys tell other researchers about commercializing their technologies and even going further, you know, to start a company in terms of like commitment of time and resources Getting, we talked a little bit about getting out of your comfort zone and doing customer discovery or doing networking, uh, you know, possibly even if you're in a position to talk to investors. I know Jared, you had um, uh, an experience in our um, Launch Blue Investment Lab where you got to talk to some investors. So talk about, you know, what does it take to kind of get yourself out of um, your comfort zone to do some of these things and commercialize your technologies? Jared, you can go. <laughs> sure. So yeah, definitely a, a huge shout out to the investment lab. That was a, a full day, awesome opportunity to get to meet with uh, angels and VCs and, and start to just kind of get inside their head and understand what they want to see. And so I think, you know, to build on what Megan was saying, one of the things that we learn as academics is that your research isn't worth doing if you don't distribute that knowledge to other people. And we primarily do that through writing and presentations and grants and things. Um, and so, I mean, I think getting the opportunity to share my thoughts with them and, and learning how to change my presentations for that particular audience. So often we're giving 20 minute or hour long seminars on our research, but how do you turn that into a five minute pitch? Um, and so, I mean, I think that was a, a really huge thing for me and, and often, I, I'm finding it to be way harder to do a five minute pitch where I don't get to talk about my science, which is clearly my comfort zone, almost at all. Um, you know, people will kind of believe that, that you're smart. Uh, <laughs> as long as you have some proof that you have proprietary protection of your technology, whatever that may be. Um, and so what they're really interested in is kind of what is the problem that you're addressing in the market. And, and I think learning those things was really impactful. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that was the investment lab, and I've talked myself away from your question. <laughs> what What other ways have you had to get outside your comfort zone as a as a researcher to to go down this commercialization path? Sure, and so I definitely would just say anybody thinking about doing it, just just do it. Um, it's going to take way more time than you think it's going to take. But if it is taking more time than you thought it would, that's probably because you're enjoying it and you're putting in that time and, and you want to keep learning. Um, so for me, a lot of it was just changing things that I read. So I, I'm really interested in reading the scientific literature, but starting to find books on, on maybe some of the business stuff that Janelle was talking about a little bit, um, as well as, as just finding blogs. So, you know, one of the things you mentioned, the, the VC world, what parts of the VC world do I need to be going after if I'm in biotech? You know, that's very different than if you do software development. There's lots of, of angels and VCs that want to do B2B SaaS and, and give you a 10x return in three to five years. Well, if I want to do a deep technology like developing a drug where we're talking hundreds of millions, borderline billions of dollars, and, and multiple years, you know, that's a specific group. How do you find them? Who are they? How do you talk to them versus other people? Um, and so, I mean, I think that's been a huge change in just my mindset. Um, it, where should I be spending my time reading? Um, and like I said, I mean, I think, you know, I've been able to do it primarily on, on nights and weekends, but I can really see Janelle's point that uh, you don't have enough time in a day to do all the things you want. And so I, you know, the ability to kind of just jump into it full bore once you have that plan kind of created, I think is, is ultimately how, you, how you're going to succeed. And so I'm, right now what I'm trying to do is kind of build that plan um, so that when I do make that leap of faith, I, I'm doing it from a, a place where I'm not every moment cringing in the corner crying, like, am I going to jeopardize my ability to have health care for myself and my family? <laughs> All right. Megan, tell us about, um, you know, how, what you would, what advice you would give to other researchers about commercializing technology and how you've gotten outside. 
the comfort zone. I so say you kind of only you almost like changed that question on me. I was all ready and prepared and then you pivoted there a little bit. All right. Advice and so out of the comfort zone, I think um, two primary things for me. One was pitching. Like Jared said, I was used to like academic science and very comfortable presenting in scientific audiences. And then I, you know, I was encouraged to pitch it at five across where there was music and running and I mean, it was a different world. It was a different world, but it was actually really, really fun. And I came to, to really kind of learn a lot about myself, I think, through that process. The other thing that's a little out of my comfort zone as like a psychologist who's like working to like serve patients and serve the world. And like, we don't often think about things in the financial, how do you make money from something, but to think about it, you know, for sustainability. And, you know, if you're doing commercialize something, you have to think about that all the pieces of like, it has to be, try to keep it profitable. And like, what does that mean? And what do you have to charge and all the, so that was in the beginning, a little bit hard for me to kind of think about that. Um, and advice for others, I would say, um, just get started. You know, if you have something you're really passionate about, just take one step at a time, do one thing a day. I, even if it's like send an email one day or, you know, research one thing a day, just to kind of slowly take, take it one task at a time and just get started and dive in. What about you, Janelle? Um, well, yeah, let's see. It's, it seems like there's a couple of embedded questions here. So I'll just start talking and hopefully I don't go off on some rabbit trail. Uh, the moderator has confused you guys. I apologize for that. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, it's a process. Um, yeah, let's see. You mentioned comfort zone, uh, getting out of your comfort zone. So I guess the question is, you know, what is your comfort zone? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, basically an introverted kind of person who's most comfortable by myself. Um, although um, when I left high school, I wanted to be an actress uh, and major in drama. So I, I, if anybody's ever read that book, Quiet, um, it's about the introverts that actually have developed the skills to seem extroverted when you need to, uh, but it just takes a ton of energy. So, um, you know, and like I said, there is some theatrics to it when you're giving these pitches and stuff like that. Um, and so I wouldn't say that's outside of my comfort zone. I just know it takes energy. And so, you know, um, uh, uh, anyway, just take that into account. Um, now, the, the real uh, outside of my comfort zone is, uh, you know, things like, and, and Eric will attest to this, is customer discovery. It's like, don't make me call people and talk to them, please. You know, you extroverts definitely have a have an advantage there. Um, but uh, I, I have forced myself to do that a, a bit and uh, it's been very, a, a, a great process. Um, I would also say in terms of, um, you know, uh, comfort zones and imposter syndromes and, and things like that. Um, it's, you know, one of the nice comforting things about academia is, is, you know, you can have this idea or publish this paper or something, and there's no huge risk with publishing a piece of paper, but when you like put yourself out there and you're making this device, like the notion that somebody else is going to buy it from me and, and then actually use it is really scary. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, you know, well, obviously we're not going to sell it. Nobody's going to buy until we've done a lot of testing and, and, you know, it'll, it'll all be good, but, but handing it over to somebody else to test and give you feedback is, is, is terrifying, honestly. Um, and so I guess that's, uh, that's the comfort zone question. Um, uh, advice question, I would say, um, yeah, maybe if you think you want to do it, uh, you know, jump in and stuff, but, um, you know, it, it may or may not be for everybody. Um, and, you know, one thing I kind of try to used to look at when I, you know, was managing my staff or students or, or things like that, research projects and stuff, um, you know, I would, I would ask them or, or observe, it's like, what do you do when you're by yourself and you have a little bit of extra time? Well, it's like, where's your low potential state? Are you in your office doing programming or are you maybe out in the clinic hanging out and seeing what people are doing and then offering to help or, um, you know, are you just calling somebody because you haven't talked for a while? You know, think about what your, your natural state is and what really makes you happy on any given day. Um, because that's, the, and honestly, I've been doing a lot of soul searching myself lately also. It's like, you know, what, what is success? 
You know, is it that you have this multi gazillion dollar company and you sell it and you're rich? I mean, if that's your definition of success, it may, you know, that's a long road. You know, people always say, oh, we went on Shark Tank and, you know, flipped this company and now, you know, you're living on your yacht and, and all of that kind of thing. It is a long, long haul. Um, and so you really need to um, get uh, fulfillment out of, uh, out of the process, uh, I would say. Yeah. So speaking about the process, how do you guys think that you still need to grow as an entrepreneur? What are, what are some things that you've read about or you've talked to people about um, and you say, well, I want to get to that point? are, you know, as an entrepreneur, and I, I need to do these things to get there. Have you thought about that at all? This is also a curveball question that wasn't in the list. <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed to ask that, Tanya. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think for me, I, it's just a continual learning process. I think I can't think that far ahead. And especially like thinking about where my company is right now and, and what our next steps are. I'm very focused on kind of the next step with this maybe vision and could go to some different directions in the future, but really just focusing on learning everything I can as I go along. And when I find a new barrier, which is probably weekly, figuring out how am I going to overcome that barrier and, and what do I need to learn like in kind of the short short term. I will say one of the, the, the surprising things which you didn't ask me about at all. So we'll just throw this in there. Um, is that learning to present um, as an entrepreneur also inform the way I present my research as well. So I feel like all of my skills as an academic as well improved um, as I as you start to kind of think about how people um, process things differently and, and thinking about your messaging very carefully. I think that is was directly applicable. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed that. I'm hoping to continue maybe to grow to grow in that space as well. So Megan, we do hear that a lot from our uh, researchers that uh, go on this entrepreneurial path that it informs their research the next time they go back into the lab and they're looking to discover something new, which is a good thing. So who's next? Jared, do you want to talk about uh, where growth as an entrepreneur? Sure. So, I mean, I think really for me, what I'm trying to spend most of my time on in the evenings and weekends right now is, is understanding how to create a sustainable business model so that um, I can take a, a low margin asset and, and use it to, to create sustainable production of, of our therapeutic that gets to the people that need it that really you know don't have a lot of money to pay for it. Um, and so are there other markets that I can leverage that can build the infrastructure I need to get it to where there's a less, less a return on investment, but where the need is really high. And so I think where I've been spending a lot of time and, and really looking to continue to grow it is that business part. You know, how do I put a plan together so that I do feel comfortable to, to jump out and, and go full time? Because that, that actually does give you some benefits into what you can apply for, um, and, and there are just some really, really amazing programs through, through the United States government and through Kentucky Match and through um, that, that you can take advantage of, but you need somebody that is more than 60% full, so basically full time um, in, in the company. And so I think, you know, setting up so that the day that I do um, make that leap that I know exactly what, what I'm doing for the next kind of thousand days. You know, what, what, what am I doing? What, are, what am I trying to address? So that's really where my, where my uh, current learning is focused. Okay. Janelle? <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess the question was, you know, what, what new evolution in terms of my entrepreneurship do I want to get to? Um, I, um, I want to have customers. I want customers to see this and give me feedback um, and you know tell me what's good and tell me what's bad and, and stuff like this because uh, um, and it's so um, it's challenging with a medical device, right? Because um, in the whole uh, lean startup framework, you have this minimum viable product. It's build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, um, and that's easier 
if you're a software guru and you have a website or something like that, and you can make you know two separate websites and see who clicks on on most of these and stuff like that. But well, you have an, a medical device that requires FDA clearance before you're even allowed to sell it. Uh, it's it's a lot more challenging. So um, we're working through um, you know kind of how to get. Um, a minimum viable product out there um, and get, um, you know, even if, uh, even if we're not, you know, directly selling it, we can, you know, at least get some customer feedback and, um, and, you know, and it's not just, um, uh, uh, it's, it, it's not just for the money and how am I going to design this product, but um, it really, it really, uh, Give, gives you a, a, a jolt. It, it reminds you of why you're doing this, you know, to, to have a customer. I mean, we've had some, you know, uh, potential customers come out and take a look at it. And, and um, someone said, this thing is great. It's like, just, you know, when can I buy 10? <laughs> you know, and that's what you want to hear, right? And you come back and, and you're so energized and you're focused. It's like, yeah, we can do this and we, and we need to do this, right? Um, and, you know, what, it, what, what I've heard is that the last thing that you want to do is spend a bunch of time and money building something that nobody wants to buy. And so it's, it's so critical. That's, that's where we're at now. We need to get this out there um, and get some reassurance that somebody wants to buy this or they want to buy kind of this, but if you could do that, that would be better. <laughs> right. So I'm really anxious to, uh, to get to that point here in the hopefully near future, very near future. So Megan, would you like to speak on being on the precipice of sales and how exciting that is for you? Yeah, so um, it's been quite a journey to get to be able to sell, even though I actually had kind of the minimal viable product available in the beginning of coming to UK. Um, there was a lot of licensure and um, production, all these kinds of things to work through, but I actually have product now, real actual product. And um, I think I have an Amazon site that might be working. Um, that was another adventure, um, maybe. It's close at least. And we've shipped our first set of product to Amazon, which is where we're gonna start our initial sales from. So I'm hoping, and we also have like a list of folks that have emailed me requesting the product. So I'm really hoping potentially um, in the next oh, you know, weeks to months, we will have actually made made sales and really be launching. And I think that will re-energize everything as well um, as we can start that. I do think one thing that helps me keep going is some of the research that we've done on it. We've got some of the, the comments that Janelle was mentioning around, um, no, this is really how this helped my kid in this way. And this is how we use it. So we've got some of that. And we had distributed quite a few kits through the nonprofit sector previously. So we have some of that energy around it. So just kind of getting up getting up and running um, is exciting. So Megan, uh, to that point, someone asked a question, uh, what are some of the unique challenges you face with doing customer discovery with children? Um, so I think it probably depends on how you're doing your customer discovery. So mine was all through IRB approved research. Um, and so for, and that's my specialty is working with kids and doing research with kids. So for me, it just, it folded right in and we built in customer discovery as we were creating the, the product um, with kids. There's a lot of different, I think, groups you can go to. Like if it's, if it's something that's hospital relevant, they have a lot of like family um, advisory boards that sometimes will give you feedback on things because they're really motivated to help their kids with things. You might be able to go to a school board. And again, you have to jump through some hoops to get permission, but there's a lot of already established places um, that with the right partners and permissions, I don't, I don't find it, I don't think it's that, that challenging, um, but I am used to working in, in that space as well. Okay, so this is for all of you all. What is a big win in the process for you so far? What, what, talk about one or two big wins that you've had in this process. Jared. I'm, yeah, I'm so I'm happy to talk. So I would say I'm definitely on the very beginning part of this process, but I think probably the most, the biggest moment that has gotten me excited is that as part of my customer discovery, I tried to reach out to clinicians that are, are treating patients and, and ask them about their pain points 
and after listening to them for a little bit, tell them about the things that we're doing and to hear their excitement. Um, and so, I mean, I think that really got me motivated. And, and I'll just say the biggest win that we've had to date, the thing that had me jumping up and down, screaming, running around the building was, you know, we dosed our first real malaria patient and we cleared their disease within 24 hours, which is as fast or faster than the, the fastest FDA approved therapeutic. And, and, I, and, and for that moment, I sat back and I said to myself, something that I put my blood, sweat and tears into cured somebody of their disease. Um, sure, there were other ways to do that. In fact, at the end of the, this trial, they'll get standard of care therapy, which probably would have worked perfectly fine. Um, but for me, that, that's kind of the realization of, of, a, of a life's mission and, and to think this is the beginning, right? This is the first patient. And, and to think about the ability to, you know, that was an adult patient. Can we go into to children patients? So, I mean, I think one of the most devastating aspects about malaria is that 70% of the 400,000 deaths every year are children under the age of five. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have two children under the age of five. So it just really resonates with me. And, and what we've done is really try to design a product to have a, a high safety profile with, with really the aim of getting into those specialty populations. And so to have that first proof of concept in an adult, um, I am just so excited and I can't wait to, to continue to build all the data that we need. So like Janelle talked about, we'll, we'll go through FDA registration and it is a long process. Mm -hmm. And if you don't cross every T and dot every I, you can really uh, end up kind of shipwrecked <laughs> uh, even after years and years at sea. So, so I think, you know, but it's those moments, um, whether it's a clinician saying, yeah, this is actually something we need. Uh, or, or hitting a value inflection point for the company, which is the demonstration of proof of concept efficacy in a real patient. Um, so, so that's probably, those are probably the wins that that's a big one. jump to my mind. Big one. Janelle, what has been your biggest win? Uh, I guess biggest win, um, I guess most recently we uh, uh, were awarded a SBIR phase one uh, grant um, from the uh, from the NIH National Cancer Institute and uh, and so uh, you know that was very validating uh, you know having a group of uh, people say oh we think this is a good idea let's let's give her a bunch of money so that was great um, uh, and the, but you know more so that uh, you know it enabled me to you know uh, hire some staff uh, I have two just wonderful people that I just uh, hired here a, about a month ago and um, just really ramping it up and you know it's really the difference between probably making it real or or just being some thing that I'm just gonna you know putter around with for for year after year um, so yeah that's probably been the the, the biggest the biggest one uh, so far okay your biggest win Megan Okay, I can't pick just one. I've had a few very exciting things. I think every time I get an email from a family who's used the product and are like, this really helped my child get through a needle stick or this helped my child get through chemotherapy or this, you know, those kinds of things. Every, every single one of those to me feels like a huge win because that's really the primary, you know, the passion with the part of the product. But then on the business ends of things, I think um, getting the licensing agreement worked out was pretty huge for me. I learned a lot through that process. Um, so that was definitely really huge. Um, getting the website put up even, I mean, just like kind of those milestones around. And then I am really looking forward to the big win of that first sale. And I can feel it coming. I know it's going to be here soon. Um, but I think some of all of those things were, were pretty substantial for me. Yeah. And congratulations on, on getting your website up and ready for sale. And we look forward to celebrating with you when you make that first sale. Um, so let's see, we have another question. So uh, uh, along with your biggest win, what can you pick out one challenge that has been, uh, you know, a thorn in your side through this process? Licensing. It's really hard. <laughs> Licensing it a long time. It's a win and a, and a challenge. And yeah, when you get it done with, it's amazing. But um, <laughs> Uh, it, that was for me a very, that was a big challenge for me. Um, and then also learning to be an Amazon seller. I think that there's a lot of potential there. I'm really hopeful this is an amazing route. Um, but that also has been really, it's really nuanced. So trying to figure out how to, how to work with that too. 
those have been challenges for me. So I think you're one of uh, one of the things that complicated your licensing challenge is the other institution that was involved. So it was a lot of negotiation there that had to happen. So um, Janelle, your biggest challenge? Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure it's it's been one challenge. Uh, it's just the the ever present challenge of the fact that everything takes. 20 times longer than you think it will, <laughs> you know, I'm, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm overly optimistic. I know, I think you have to be to, to do this in the first place. I mean, if, if you're not an overly optimistic uh, person, then you maybe want to think about not, not trying this. Um, so everything's just taken longer than, than you, than you want it to. Uh, but I think sometimes that impatience, it's good. It's just, come on, uh, let's do it. Um, what else? Um, I think, you know, and, and uh, I, again, um, it's, it's been how to, uh, how to get some like early sales and early revenue and some customer traction and stuff like that and still manage the FDA uh, and, you know, get the technology development, you know, behind the product. Um, I, you know, I feel like, um, I feel like there's a, this, this pop moment that's going to happen fairly soon. And, you know, it's, it's where you just keep working and you're slogging and you're working and you're slogging and, and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, like one day, everything just kind of comes together and pops and, and there you are. Um, and I feel like we're, we're getting there. Um, it's it's going to happen uh, sometime soon. I think that you just have to have faith that you're going to pop at some point <laughs> as opposed to deflate I don't, you don't you don't want that but uh, yeah so those those two things probably the entrepreneurs aren't typically known for having patience but that's exactly the thing that you have to have <laughs> to get yeah. through the process yeah. <laughs> so Jared what's been your biggest challenge so I, I will totally say the biggest challenge for me was I saw a huge unmet clinical need we were able to, to deliver stuff through proof of concept that, that shows superiority in some ways. Um, and I thought, oh, well, that's it. We'll be done. People will be lining up at the door. They'll be saying, hey, this is the greatest thing. Uh, and, and so the, the realization that, well, that only happens if, if you are promising them lots of money. Um, and, and if that's not your goal, then you need to promise them something else that it that they're interested in and then finding the people so for for me it's kind of trying to find impact investors so if i try to go after and this is what happened at the uh, investment lab i i got the chance to meet with bluegrass angels queen city angels a couple of different vcs uh, and i said this is my technology we're you know we've cured our first patient we're doing this we're actually doing this and, and they said so what's your roi in three to five years and i said well, you know, it's, it's, it's a drug. We have to go through the FDA registration process three, three to five years. We probably won't even be through that. And they're like, well, if it's not 10 X and it's more than five years, then we're just not going to talk to you. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you and tell you, we don't touch anything with registration in it. 10 foot pole. That's, that's way too close. hundred foot pole. Um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, that that's been one of the challenges is to have that resilience like okay so so the first thing didn't work second thing didn't work third thing didn't work that's okay and i think that's one of the things that i really draw on from my research experience right we always joke that it's called research because you get to redo it when it doesn't work um and so i feel like that's been my my intro into how do we finance and, and make a sustainable company you just keep throwing ideas out there and talking to people that you you know and trust and building relationships with them. And hopefully you've built a relationship where they just say, yeah, that's just never going to work. And, and then you just go back and you come up with a new idea and you come back the next week, whether it's, you know, once a month with Eric talking or, or I've been through my um, different informational interviews and, and customer discovery, been able to solidify connections with people all over the world that are gracious and give me 30 minutes of their time every six to eight weeks. And I, I just talk to them um, and they just help me iterate. And, and so, I mean, I think, you know, we're talking about the minimum viable product, the, the, the iterations to make it better. You know, with the drug, I'm not gonna be able to really change the drug product that we have. 
you know, we have 40 kilograms of a drug product, something like 4,000 capsules. Um, at this point, I'm probably not going to change what's in that capsule. But what I can change is, is how the business plan to take that into uh, translating into, you know, actual adoption at the country level. So getting through the FDA is really the first part of it, right? Once you have that stringent regulatory authority, how do you get adoption in endemic countries? Uh, and then how do you sustain the business that pays for the manufacturer distribution? Uh, ultimately, you know, you're chunking into your project, your product, your profits each time that you partner with a distribution company or, or go through a reimbursement process. And so how do you do that and get life-saving medicine to the people that need it, but also make sure that, you know, you're doing it not to go broke. Um, you, you know, you want to eat on your table too. <laughs> um, and you want to be able to pay your rent on your manufacturing buildings and be ready for the FDA to come audit you and all those things. So, so certainly that's been my biggest challenge. The company has to make a profit <laughs> to stay in business, to do the great things and get the, the products out um, to the people who need them. So yes, that's very important. So um, talk about uh, what you've learned about yourself uh, in this journey. Um, any, any insights there that um, you guys have been able to pick up on? Megan is smiling, so I'm gonna call on her. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I've learned loads along the way here. I think, I, I don't know if it's more learning Maybe it's learning about myself or learning about what it means to be an entrepreneur and that that I like possess that capacity potentially. Um, and I really enjoy it a lot. I also have been, I mean, I am a stats person. So I do like numbers and stuff and I do love doing budgets. And so there's a lot of the things that kind of go along with it that I, that I really enjoy that I've kind of been able to grow in um, and learning a lot. Um, yeah, I just, I think... Maybe just in the confidence that it's something that was actually within my reach. Um, and previously, I really probably conceptualized myself much more as an academic and would love somebody else to have managed this. Um, but in managing it, I'm learning a lot along the way and about the product, about the needs, about like how everything goes together, um, like how to how to market kind of market the mission overall. Um, I have a, a brand new book coming out as well that, that aligns with the mission of the Sully Coping Company, afraidofthedoctor.com in case anyone wants to check it out. So it um, goes, it really aligns with the business goals and like trying to think about how, how those two things align and how can we bring those things together to try to get the messaging out that there are things we can do to help our kids through difficult medical challenges. Um, and that there's other paths besides like the straight traditional academic path. So maybe confidence in that and, and flexibility. And I want to point out that Megan has her website address um, in her name on, on her screen. So if you want to go check out Sally Coping, um, go to her website. Uh, Janelle, what have you learned about yourself in this process? Um, Thanks for, for uh, going first, Megan, so I could stall and figure out what my answer was while you were talking. Um, what have I learned about myself? I have learned that, um, so I'm, I'm really good at, at conceptualizing things. Um, I'm always kind of the big thinker. Um, and, and I always fancied myself, um, you know, oh, when I'm not working anymore, I'll have more time to do this. And then I will, like I do woodworking, uh, you know, as a hobby and stuff. It's like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to build this, you know, these beautiful whatever. And, and once I do it a few times, it's going to be, I'm going to get better and better. And I'm going to be this, and I vision, I'm going to be this real um, artisan, skilled expert in making the finest of, of something. Um, I'll... Uh, you know, I'll be a, a programmer or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and I finally learned that um, just because I fancied myself as being really good at something doesn't mean that if I have time, I'm actually going to be good at, <laughs> at that particular thing. Um, so um, I'm learning, I'm learning where to draw the line between um, what I actually am good at. And what I do think I'm good at is having a vision um, and, and 
learning. I, 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 I have a, I have a farmer's kind of intelligence. I, I think why I didn't click in, in academia so much was I am not a knowledge for knowledge sake kind of person. I'm a farmer's kind of, uh, I, I, I need to know basis. <laughs> I want to figure out, I want, I know, I, I know this needs to be done. It would be good. So I'm going to learn what I need to learn in order to get this done. And when you have that kind of um, uh, I don't know, personality, I guess, I'm never gonna be the person that's going to perfect something, but I will be the person that will envision it, slog through and prove that it can be done. And then one of the most satisfying things is once I've done that type of thing, to see somebody else say, oh, now I get it, now I get it. And then, and then they are the people to take over and like make it, good and efficient and pretty and, and all of those things that I'm quite frankly going to lose interest in <laughs> um, no, in a little bit. So yeah, I guess, I guess that's it. So you'll be a serial entrepreneur in that you'll uh, conceive these ideas, develop them, and then hand them off to someone else. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go curl up in a fetal position right now if you said that. <laughs> yeah. so Jared, what have you learned about yourself in this process? Um, I, I think just in the research process, one of the things I've learned about myself is that I like to do different things. And I think one of the things that attracts me most to being an entrepreneur is you have to wear like 50,000 different hats. And some days you're a business person and some days you're a researcher and some days you're a salesman and some days you're a marketing expert and, and, and you get to do all those different things. And at times it drives me nuts because I'm like, oh, if I could just focus on one thing, you know, kind of like Janelle was saying, I'll be an expert at, at, at marketing if I just focus on that. But I find that my, from my kind of happy place is kind of bouncing from thing to thing. Um, and it probably explains why we don't just do research in one um, area of unmet clinical need. You know, we do substance use disorder and oncology and infectious disease because I just get so excited about uh, seeing a gap and trying to close that gap. Uh, and, and as Janelle mentioned, kind of that mentality of, well, what do I, what is the bare minimum I need to know to be able to jump this hurdle so that I can now focus on, you know, this other hurdle or um, in the case of the, the building on fire, okay, I'm going to put this room out because that one's just smoldering right now. And I think it, I can just leave it. <laughs> and so I think, you know, I, I while it stresses me out, I really enjoy that ability to kind of jump from thing to thing and um, the sense of urgency and, and the sense of excitement. And um, yeah, I think all those things I really have learned a little bit more about myself. And, and they kind of like Megan said, help steer my academic career as, as well as a potential entrepreneurial career. So this is a one word answer. Would you do it Again, Megan. Yes. <laughs> yes. Janelle. <laughs> Absolutely. Jared. Definitely. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. So I, I want to thank our panel uh, for sharing their valuable insights with us today and kind of demystifying technology, commercialization, and entrepreneurship. And and for letting us in on how you were able to make that shift from thinking like a researcher to thinking more like an entrepreneur. And I do want to emphasize too that OTC is here to assist you. Got any the audience out there, if you're listening, we're here to assist you in any way we can. Uh, please reach out to us uh, about you know learning more about our programs, our intellectual property protection support, or our support through uh, con our contracts team. So please reach out to us. And I want to thank everybody uh, for attending our webinar today. And I look forward to seeing you guys next month. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.